Thank you, Ali. Um, hello, everybody. We're delighted to have you all here today. I am so honored to be moderating a panel of three of my friends um, here in Philadelphia, which is really awesome. Um, so I'm going to start us out by just very quickly going around and letting everyone introduce themselves. Um, so if you guys could just um, basically tell us a little bit about how you got interested in cell and gene therapy um, and what your role looks like these days. And then we'll, from there, we'll go on and talk to you a little bit more afterwards about your individual companies and kind of where they got started and how they came to Philly. So start by telling us a little bit about yourself individually. Um, let's start with Vinu. Hey, uh, thanks, Melina. And uh, I'm Vinu Shwari, founder and CEO of two biotech companies, uh, Ohm Life Tech and Ohm Biotech. And before I start talking about myself, I would like to first thank Tracy and Angela and the entire Venture Cafe team, you know, for this opportunity. And thanks, Melina, for moderating it. And, and also very quickly, right, uh, thanks to the healthcare and frontline workers, you know, who are doing their job, which is making us feel safe as well. And also please pray for India. I'm from there and things are not looking good over there. So coming back to me, um, Ohm Life Tech is a preclinical stage company. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, a non-viral gene therapy approach, uh, and we are leveraging our self-deliverable RNA silencing technology uh, for therapeutic development. We have a few preclinical programs right now in cancer, infectious diseases, and the CNS as well. Um, I have one more company called Ohm Biotech, and we are making our products available for the biomedical research community with a focus on gene modulation. And uh, we are very fortunate to be serving uh, the global biomedical community uh, uh, in over 27 countries to advance their you know, research and development uh, and happy to be on the panel, thanks. Great, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in cell and gene therapy? Yeah, sure. So, well, I have to go back then. So, of course I can. Um, so, you know, uh, as I told people know here, I, I'm from India and since college, uh, you know, gene, uh, gene, uh, gene silencing fascinated me since back in 2006 when I graduated. And uh, and that time, that point of time, the Nobel Prize also happened, which went to Andrew uh, and Craig Miller at Stanford and UMass. And uh, you know, genes have always been very fascinating, right? And as we continue to expand our knowledge on how genes work and how they interact with other genes, to sometimes cause a disease, and if we can find a way to you know stop those interactions that cause harm to body, I mean, that's one form of gene therapy. There are others as well. So as I mentioned to you, we are a non-viral form of gene therapy, right? And that's what makes me so interested and passionate about this field. And we are just getting started. And uh, so that's, you know, in crux, I'll let others take the lead on this as well. But just to, just to have the ability to modulate genes and to be able to find a, uh, you know, cure for a disease that just fascinates me. And there is so many things we can do for that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Matt, would you like to go next? Sure, so hi everyone, I'm Matt Handel. I'm the CEO of Express Cells. Um, we're a genetic engineering company, no surprise for this, uh, for this particular session. We're a little bit different because we're not a therapeutics company nor a diagnostics. We're a research tools company. And I always like to remind people that genetic engineering isn't just, as we heard in the last um, session about therapeutics or, or frighteningly um, designer twins. Um, it's a tool that's being used uh, very much across um, the research spectrum right now. And that's really important because if we went back 10 years or 15 years and said, you know, uh, genetically edited cells would be a normal part of your research tool set, um, we'd probably get some very confused looks. It sounded a little science fiction -y at that time. But CRISPR has helped, other technologies have helped, and it's become quite common. Um, my own personal background, uh, I come from the commercial side of life sciences. Uh, I do have a master's of science buried in my background, but I've been a commercial person for the most part. I actually came to Philadelphia in 93 um, to work at Merck, um, thinking I might stick around a year or two, and um, we're about, about 28 years later. Um, but that's important because I went from big pharma to specialty pharma at Shire, to a uh, startup world, uh, you know, in the therapeutics world, and really came to the genetic side about um, three years ago. And if you ask how I got there, um, it's because I was asked. Um, I had started a company with uh, my partner, uh, Dr. Oscar Perez out of Temple University uh, for therapeutics. It was, you know, the science did not work out, but he's a genetic uh, scientist. And he said, this is the future. This is what we need to do. He's quite persuasive, by the way. 
Um, and I'm glad he did that because we founded the company about three years ago. But that's an important takeaway as well, which is a truly successful uh, genetic engineering firm is going to be the right mix of the right science people and uh, the right uh, business people. And we'll get into this a little bit more. That's where I think Philadelphia has an advantage. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Jeff, would you like to go ahead? Sure. And thank you, Melina, for having uh, having me join. And thanks, Matt and Pinu, for, for participating. Um, so I'm Jeff Castelli. I'm the Chief Development Officer with Amicus Therapeutics. Um, Amicus is a rare disease company focused on gen developing genetic medicines for people living with rare diseases. Uh, I joined Amicus about 16 years ago. Um, we were a small private company. We're now a public company, um, have 600 patients around the world, one approved therapy, one in late stage, and a whole host of gene therapies. You know, about three years ago, we were looking at, and sorry, my dog decided to bark, of course. Um, about three years ago, we were looking for, you know, what next for us in terms of our pipeline and our research. And when you look at genetic medicines, you know, gene therapy and cell therapies are just at such a point where it almost is impossible not to be involved in those. You, you could spend, you know, 10 years and hundreds of millions of dollars developing, you know, an enzyme therapy or a small molecule therapy that could be totally, you know, made obsolete by a gene therapy. So, you're just seeing more and more companies realize they, they, you know, for genetic medicines in particular, rare diseases, it's it's a great technology to be involved with. Um, I know we'll get into it more about Philadelphia, but as we made that decision to invest in gene therapy, we also moved into Philadelphia for our R&D headquarters, our Gene Therapy Center of Excellence, which I had to put in my background. Um, I miss being in our labs, but they're on the third, 12th and 13th floor of the 3675 building, which I think everyone is familiar with. Um, and I put on the, the, the Science Center logo, sorry about that. Um, and, you know, really exciting to get back there soon and to see everyone in person uh, on the, in the Venture Cafe. Um, and uh, it, I'm not drinking a beer, but I do miss all the beers that we shared at, at those events. So look forward to the panel today. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, it's a good point. We are all neighbors in 3675. Um, just by kind of sheer coincidence, this panel is a bunch of folks who have been working together for a while. Um, so I think it's a, a really great point, Jeff, when you were speaking to kind of your team looking for locations to grow and to bring your Gene, gene Therapy Center for Excellence. Um, I was hoping you guys could tell us a little bit about, you know, have you worked in other biotech hubs and um, what led you to start your company or move your company to Philadelphia? So take it away, whoever wants to start. Uh, I'll go first. Um, I've had the ability to work in other biotech hubs because I worked um, going for, you know, for larger companies. Uh, Shire in particular, um, we had specialty farmer here, pharma here in Philadelphia. We, uh, they had um, rare diseases in the Boston area and regenerative medicine in San Diego. So got a lot of exposure to all three hubs. What do I like about Philadelphia? Um, this is gonna sound funny, big pharma. Um, why? Because there are scientists here who know how to develop therapeutics. And you may say, well, they have that in Boston, they have that in San Diego. They have a lot of really good scientists there, and some of them are really great at drug development. But there's a difference between pulling someone from an academic or a very early stage company and someone who knows how to deal with the FDA. And when we say scientists, it's not just the person who's in the lab. Um, think of regulatory affairs. Think of the people who do translational medicine um, who are now going to take what you've done in the lab and turn it into a clinical program. And I think there's a really good base here. And it's interesting. When I first made the jump uh, to uh, the entrepreneurial world, some of the people I knew were like, wow, that's a big step. Now, almost everyone I know has made the jump to a smaller company. And I think that's really important. But the other part is the commercial and business side as well. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, I know a lot of companies that are thinking, we just need to get to you know, phase one or phase two clinicals and we'll sell. We don't have to think about commercial. Well, the people who want to buy your company, they're going to be thinking about that. And the more you understand that, the better. And we have such a great base of that. And I'll say just one other thing, though I think it's changing. Um, I went to school up uh, in Boston and I, you know, when people talk about Kendall Square 
and they talk about how it was well designed and planned. And now, it, in the 90s, it was empty. People moved in because it was cheap. Well, it's not cheap to have a lab in Kendall Square anymore. <laughs> Definitely not. It is still far less expensive to have a lab in Philadelphia, even with the crunch we're having for space right now. Really great point. And if I can just add to Matt's point, I guess, uh, from an academic side as well, right? So it's, it's all about the ecosystem, right? And as, as Jeff just mentioned, right, in the same building, we are like three different companies on different floors of different sizes. So that fascinates me. And, you know, I mean, you don't get that kind of ecosystem at, at many of the cities in the in the world itself, right? And also you go next door a few blocks from here, we have Penn, Vistar, and Chop, some of these amazing institutes, which are, you know, which have very good federal funding as well. So you have a lot of collaborative opportunities in the city itself, which generates this amazing ecosystem. And that's the reason why that location is so important for us as well, that, you know, you don't get such an ecosystem. At, of, of course, there are some cities out there, but to this extent where the cost of living is also very much bearable, not like Boston, New York, no offense to those, those cities, but Philly is still, you know, you can still do your thing and you can still do, you know, uh, the best of the research over there, I guess. Yeah, and I'll just add on, you know, when we, so clearly we, before we came to Philadelphia, we were in the um, kind of Princeton area, New Jersey corridor, and, you know, much more larger pharma, some large biotech there. You know, as we were looking for the R&D headquarters and our gene therapy, I'm going to yell at my dog. <laughs> we, um, we, we looked across all of the, um, the whole, you know, northern part of the country from Boston down to Florida, North Carolina, looking for where to locate. And, you know, it's not surprising. We looked at things like talent, the location itself, um, the facilities you could find and the cost. And really, Philadelphia just stacked up on all of those really well. I think, as Matt said, there's there's real drug development knowledge here, but you combine that with all of the cutting edge academic research that's happening, and the very proactive, you know, tech transfer groups at those universities that are trying to get those new discoveries out. And it's just a great, you know, environment to kind of start up new companies to have a lot of wealth of talent. And I think 3675, the building is really a microcosm of the city now, sort of where you see just a really diverse group of people and companies that are going after genetic research, genetic medicine, cell therapy. And I think we've reached sort of that critical mass where it's now, you know, there's a wealth of, of talent relative to other places. Not that there's not a lot of growth and we need more people, but I've certainly seen a number of my colleagues from Amicus move on to some smaller companies in the area. And, and vice versa. So it is having that group of, of um, people with experience in this area is also super valuable. And if you're out there looking for an area to get involved in, right now, cell and gene therapy expertise is su super valuable in the workplace. Anyone who has any amount of experience is like an instant sort of want by companies. So it's a great place to start to, to work. That, those are all great points. I'm actually really interested in. Um, something you all sort of mentioned in parallel, which is, you know, space is at a crunch right now in Philadelphia. I certainly know that very well from, from my role. Um, but why is location as critical to all of you? I mean, all of you have chosen to be in University City, right downtown in Philadelphia, right next to the universities. Um, when there is, you know, cheaper space out in the suburbs, for example, what, what is it about that kind of density and hyper locality that's been important to your companies? We'll change it up. I'll go first. And then, um, you know, for us, we have a collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania to, to really kind of work closely with them and our discovery and being co-located was huge. You know, we can actually walk samples back and forth rather than have to ship them and, and just, you know, pre-COVID being able to meet face to face easily was huge. You know, and in the suburbs, it's just your you don't have that same co-locality either in the vibrancy of being, you know, in the same building with people that are doing other technologies. I mean, we've ended up having chats with people that are working on complementary technologies and, you know, you just couldn't easily do that if you were out in, in the suburbs. And plus Philadelphia is, is awesome. But. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll add a couple of things, which is um, we, you know, we like shared lab space. Um, thank you, Melina. Um, but when you're, you know, this, 
you know, Amicus is a large company now and it's a great neighbor to have. Um, we're less than three years old. And when you're trying to start up, having incubator type space where you can share, um, you know, share equipment, you know, that's really important. But it's, I'm gonna add about the people as well. It's really good to be able to interact. You know, I spent decades working in the suburbs and you go to the office and then you go home. Um, you know, you want to be in a space where you, you know, scientists can meet other scientists, where you can trade information. Um, I'll be honest, I really miss uh, the in-person Venture Cafe. I, and not just for the beer, though I did like the beer, um, but, you know, there are a lot of people, some of whom are on this call that I first met, you know, at Venture Cafe, just chatting with people. And I'll say a third thing, and this sounds funny, but being in the middle of everything, um, we're a revenue generating company. We actually have customers that we have met uh, in the building or through these networks. And that's important. Um, you know, yeah, you can, um, you know, go to your job in the suburbs and, you know, try to do things over the internet, but I'm still a big believer in meeting human beings and um, getting to know people. Yeah, and, and for me also, right, I'm a city person, right, for me, I like to see people, you know, I, I want to be, you know, I, I'm like that kind of a person, but also I think recruitment wise also, right, so when you're rec recruiting people, sometimes it helps if you are in a nice fancy building in the middle of the city, right, so I think that also is a good factor for us and, and both, you know, your organization, Melina Biolabs and CIC, I think, you know, these are some amazing organizations which are really, you know, the backbone, uh, you know, becoming a backbone for the startups as well, right? Because you provide such an amazing services, which, I mean, it's like, you know, when you go to Google and Apple, right? I mean, they can afford all these fancy things, but as a startup, we cannot. So like in this building only, right? You have all these different amenities and whatnot. Thanks to COVID, we don't have that for the past one year, but before that, right? So, so as you know, uh, before CIC, we were at the Science Center next door. And when CIC came, the price was a little bit up, but then I decided to be here because it pushes me to you know, find more money so that I can stay here, right? So if you're living in luxury, it just pushes me as well personally that, okay, now you have to you know, come to the next level. And uh, so uh, I'm happy that I made that decision. And I think for me, mostly recruitment is also important. And uh, I think that you know, if you're here, like Matt said, in the middle of the city, you can get, you know, you can attract more talent as opposed to going to a suburb. So that's also critical for us, I guess. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely have noticed that um, just going back a little bit to the density thing we were talking about that, you know, over the period of COVID, and we'll talk a little bit more about COVID and how it's affected all of our different businesses. Um, but one of the things that's been a very small silver lining from COVID is that I feel like there are ways in which it's bonded the community um, that I kind of didn't expect. And so our friends at Integral Molecular across the street, which is an awesome company, um, started a university city biotech HR call that we have every month where we just get on the call and talk about hiring and COVID management and all of these kind of um, HR topics that have you know really become hot topics right now, but are gonna continue to be challenges for companies as they grow forever. Um, Biolabs just started a lab manager's version of that and like knowing somebody upstairs or across the street um, who, you know, can help you out when you're short on pipette tips or you need an extra thing of liquid nitrogen, whatever it might be, those like adjacencies and collaborations and frankly friendships are an incredibly valuable thing and that's that's really kind of made me a true believer in the, the density um, being an important thing. So really curious to hear um, Shifting a little bit to talking about community, how do you guys see the ecosystem as having changed in, let's say, the last three, five years? Um, I know Philadelphia, I mean, the Philadelphia cell and gene therapy ecosystem has been up and coming for a really long time, thanks in great part to work by the Science Center and all the major institutes and universities and everything here, but it's really certainly exploded in, like, let's say, the last three to five years. Um, what has changed? What has felt to you guys like the thing that's really put Philadelphia over that tipping point? I think um, um, willingness to accept risk. Um, you know, I, I, I told you I started at Merck. Um, mm -hmm. Merck's a great organization, it was a great place to start my career, but a risk oriented uh, organization, it was not. Um, 
you know, big pharma, it, I actually once heard it described as it's a very risky business run by the most risk averse people you could ever find. Um, and that did permeate the culture. And I think it also impacted Philadelphia, the life sciences community. I think that has really changed. There's something that's happened in the last five or so years where it's gone from you know, a, you know, a more conservative, little c conservative community to one where I, I get the feeling everyone's looking to um, you know, make the jump. I'm not sure what happened, um, but I'm glad it did. You know, one, one thing I think, um, and again, I, myself and Amicus, we weren't that you know, familiar with the Philadelphia biotech environment three, three years ago, two or three years ago. But from speaking to people, it seems like there used to be a lot of talent here from academics and small companies in gene and cell therapy that would be exported out. They'd kind of get a certain amount of training and then they'd head off to Boston or wherever. And we were great at developing initial talent, but then we lost it all. And it seems like there got to a point where there was a critical mass reached on sort of the, the ecosystem here that it now kind of became more of a import of talent and keeping the talent that was here. And I, I don't know if whether that was just critical mass or something like that, but it seems that there's been this tipping point uh, as Matt mentioned. Yeah, I think the money is coming in now. I mean, we see, I mean, as you know very well, in January, just Q1, I think uh, in Philadelphia-based companies raised over close to a billion dollars in gene and cell therapy. There was a report by the Chamber of Commerce, right? So money is coming in and you can see a lot of buildings popping up every you know, few months now. So excited to be a part of this ecosystem now, I guess that's, yeah. Yeah. One of the other things that kind of goes back to what Jeff mentioned about talent exporting is that we're also seeing a lot of companies stay in Philadelphia that start in Philadelphia and a lot of interest coming from outside of Philadelphia. So Amicus, of course, being a great example, but I definitely remember talking to some folks when I first started here, which was fall of 2018, who were like, you know, maybe someday Philly's ecosystem will be there, but for now we're gonna take our company up to Boston, for example, right? Um, or Cambridge. Companies that started out of Penn or started out of Philadelphia more broadly, started out of any of the, the institutes here, um, and there definitely has been a shift in why would you leave Philadelphia now, right? I've heard from some of our resident companies that they've actually heard those words from VCs outside of the state saying, why would you leave Philly? Money is, you know, transportable, but. Uh... Well, I, so um, there was a um, VC that I follow. I'm not going to say who it is. Um, I respect him a lot, but once wrote a blog post that basically can be summarized as, um, the Boston ecosystem is so great. Um, we would doubt, you know, we don't want to invest in people who don't seem to understand that's where they should be. I did not agree with that. I still respect him. I'd love for him to invest in our company. Um, but I, that's where I think things have changed. So a uh, good example uh, is, um, uh, I always pronounce this incorrectly, is on Tegeny. Um, which is uh, Chris Garabendian's um, investment vehicle, announced five new uh, companies they invested in um, yesterday. Three of them are in the Philly area. You know, he's based up in Boston. And I think what we're seeing now is that um, the money, uh, as was pointed out, is now starting to flow here rather than um, people having to leave to get the money. So, um, and then 2020 happened. <laughs> Curious to hear kind of how COVID affected your individual companies and just the ecosystem as a whole and anything that you guys can speak to about kind of the impact that that's had, you know, as we're starting to see the future coming out of it. Um, we're not there yet, but we're uh, hopefully all vaccinated. Um, what was that experience like for you guys and how do you think it may have dented or accelerated the Philadelphia ecosystem? I mean, I'll jump in. It's, a, it's actually 14 months ago today that we announced that we were going to start working from home, um, which is amazing that it's been that long. But only a week or two before that, we had our ribbon cutting, by the way, for our R&D our, our center at 3675. Even, even though we'd been there for a few months before that, we had our official sort of ceremony. And then literally the next week got shut down. But um, That's the last party I went to. <laughs> 
I'm not sure if it was a spreader event. I didn't hear about anything. So before we all knew, uh, we had some sanitizer, I think, at the time. Um, but you know, our our science group has been going in throughout the pandemic. They they did not stop at any point. We've had anywhere you know from thirty to fifty scientists going in and working throughout the pandemic. Um, you know. Research scientists were kind of categorized as emergency use if they were, you know, directed towards healthcare research. Um, but everyone in our office-based, you know, roles has not been in the office at all yet. Um, I do feel like I know me personally, and, and some of the office-based people, you know, we do miss having that interaction that we were having, and it, it does feel a little disconnected. Why it's it was just great to have. These types of virtual events to keep that connection going. Um, I think it's just hard, hard to do that sort of networking in a virtual environment to some extent. So I think it's really been felt there just in terms of that kind of lack of connection with the kind of ecosystem. I really felt like we were really starting to embrace that whole community there and looking for ways to kind of do a lot more and it sort of some things got put on pause it felt like. You know we're super excited to dive back in and keep things, you know, moving again. But it, it definitely feels like it, you know, sort of we hit a pause button in some ways. And yes, for us, I guess, you know, research never stopped, right? And um, it, it did slow us down. And, you know, we were still, you know, doing what we were supposed to do. And half of my team was working remotely. But, you know, what I missed the most is, you know, those human interactions, right? The, the best part of being in a startup company is people can knock on your door and discuss ideas, right? Yeah. So as, I mean, we love to be on Zoom calls and whatnot, but I think the reason we start the company is so that, you know, we can have those lively discussions, right? So, so that is something which I'm still missing. I mean, right now also, you know, we have a hybrid model where half my team is coming, you know, 50% of the time and whatnot. But so, uh, yeah, I mean, that is something which, you know, really I miss a lot where, you know, I can really interact with my team, uh, you know, five days a week, but uh, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get back on track now, I guess. And for a small company, I think it's extremely important because, you know, uh, I think some companies like Amicus, I mean, they are, they can easily, you know, install those things and, you know, but a small company, you know, we don't have those systems where virtual work may not be possible all the time, I guess. I don't know, Matt has, Something some experience are different. Well, you're bringing up a good point, which is when you look at a company, it's who can work from home and who can't. Um, I can work from home. You're seeing my lovely basement. Um, you know, our our finance people, commercial people, you know, operations consultant can all do things from home. Our scientists can't. You know, they have to, and this is the same for all of your scientists and many people on this call right now you have to physically go in or the work simply cannot get done. And that was a real challenge for us. We shut down for a few weeks uh, while we tried to figure out what we should do. And then we reopened, um, you know, and I've got to give praise to the CIC team and Molina for the work you've been doing and leading um, to have a, a safe workspace. That being said, you know, there, we also had other ripple effects, you know, Jeff pointed out uh, it was 14 months to the day that um, you all decided to work from home. Well, we're four, 14 months and four days from when we first launched our catalog. And, you know, launching your catalog the week that everything shuts down is not the best way to earn money. I'm going to tell you that. Um, there was also a ripple effect, which we had, um, we're dependent on customers. Well, until their labs reopened, we couldn't do work for them, you know, where they weren't going to order anything. So um, things are much better now, but I think we saw the, not just the impact on our people, but the impact on the economy, because I think it really took uh, about two months for everyone to figure out, A, this was not going to end anytime soon, and B, we had to get work done anyway. And I think if anything, the last 14 months have been a massive experiment in um, human ingenuity to get things done. Yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, we never fully shut down, speaking just from my perspective, biolabs um, at CIC, which is on the fifth and sixth floors of the building. We never fully shut the labs, but it definitely, like the number of people who chose to come on site shifted dramatically up and down over the last year and you know we've had to put a lot of extra planning into place um, to keep the labs open because you know yes they're essential employees absolutely but you're also dealing with the city and the state and making sure that 
we're following best practice, but also that, you know, there's no chance that those doors are going to get locked, right? There were a lot of conversations with uh, senior government folks saying, <laughs> how do we how do we ensure that this keeps happening? Because exactly to what you guys are saying, you can't stop science, right? You really can't shut down a lab where you have cells that you're trying to keep alive. It's just not possible. So that definitely was an interesting challenge. And I know it has affected the actual productivity of many of our residents just because they can't have as many people working side by side at the bench and still be socially distanced, right? Well, but this is where I'm also gonna throw in a pitch for Philadelphia. Um, in the midst of a national tragedy, opportunity did arise in the life science world. You know, if you think of the publications that have come out in the last 14 months or the studies, some of them are coming from Philadelphia-based uh, research institutions. You're seeing that also in um, what's going on here in terms of companies. I know, Melina, you've been tracking what um, companies just within the CIC and um, Biolabs uh, facility are doing. You know, I know we developed some cell lines around, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2. That was sort of small, but that's the nice thing about genetic engineering. If you have the right tools, you can actually work fairly quickly to develop, you know, diagnostics or therapeutics against a, a new virus, you know, something that you couldn't have done back in the old days of uh, small molecules. So I think we have seen that within Philadelphia, um, in the midst of a national tragedy, we've seen the scientific and business community pull together and actually do a pretty good job of trying to address it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your company is one of three within our space that's pivoted to COVID for trying to, you know, that really, <laughs> if nothing else would get, get everyone up in the morning um, in the darkest days of the pandemic, kind of feeling like supporting folks who were really trying to fight all of this and, and keep other really critical research moving towards the clinic. Honestly, that gets me up in the morning. Um, curious to hear, hear a little bit about um, what the ecosystem and the community means to you guys. I don't wanna to get too far off um, off track, but you know, I feel like this, this, this theme keeps coming up that we're bumping into companies of other sizes, companies working on parallel technologies. All three of you work on technologies that are somewhat similar in the aim, but different in the, the kind of specifics and the technologies that you're bringing to it. Um, what, what does community, uh, specifically the biotech community in Philadelphia, really bring to mind for you guys and how, how does it feel special to you? I think I can start a little bit on that. So I think for me, community is, you know, uh, I get inspired a lot, you know, when I walk through the halls of, the, of, of my space, right? For me, competition is also very important. So of course we look for collaborations, but competition also you know, kicks me in the rear and say, okay, you know, you have to you know, do the next thing, right? So like you said, uh, I mean, like we discussed saying earlier, right, if you're in the suburbs, you know, and if you're by yourself, then you know, th those triggers don't happen all the time, right? So uh, I respect both the companies which we are which we are collaborating with, but I also respect a lot companies which you know uh, which we which may be competing with us and push us to you know do more innovation, right? And as we discussed earlier, also right, uh, not only is the pharmaceutical side of things, but you go a few blocks from here and we have all these fancy institutes, and you know I like these numbers a lot, but you know uh, Philadelphia uh, in terms of NIH funding receives a lot of money. I mean, just in 2020, I think I was reading on the NIH website, we just fully received $1 billion in NIH funding, which yeah. is half Pennsylvania's. Pennsylvania received 2 billion, which in, in Philadelphia received one, like half the state money, right? So that's just incredible, right? So that's what opportunity is, right? Again, I'm pitching for fully now that, you know, if you have so much federal money lying in there, plus the venture money, you should come here, right? If people from outside the city are listening, come here, we are here, you know, to partner, right? So, but, but again, coming back to the community and ecosystem, right? I mean, I guess it's, it's a composition of, you know, both the enablers like yourself, Melina, I mean, your company and CIC again, kudos to them who are, you know, helping and creating this ecosystem. But then we have these academic labs uh, where we have all this intellectual capital. And then we have companies like ours who will, you know, talk to the tech transfer offices and, you know, try to commercialize those technologies. So all these things in this small area of a few miles, I mean, it's just incredible. And uh, I mean, I've been in Philly for past 10 years. I mean, I came from India, right? So I, I, and I've been fortunate to be, to have visited a lot of cities all over the world, but nothing like Philadelphia, right? At this price point, again, that's the important thing. I mean, you cannot 
someone like me uh, with a small company like like mine could not have survived uh, you know in boston new york area because of the price points over there so all this in, in such a small area of a few miles i think that's just incredible uh, in terms of community and we we support each other right because when i see fellow ceos if i have a problem we see how they have done that and failure is you know as you know very well you know for 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 me failure is an option but quitting is not right so if you fail we can learn how the other companies survived and this is pushing each other right it's not that you know you just you know pass out and don't do nothing but uh, that just motivates you to more, more and more and it's all about it's it's all a function of ecosystem i guess yeah one thing i'll add to that you know is for me and you know i feel like some of my colleagues at amicus it's it's the e philadelphia ecosystem is really just about sort of the the innovation and the vibrancy and sort of the shared enthusiasm and mission and just seeing you know people doing very different aspects of work but that all are interrelated in some way and then most importantly you know the personal connections that you can make you know look, there's tons of people doing amazing research all around the world and you don't have to be co-located to work and collaborate but a lot of times you don't take the time to learn about those you know complementary technologies and think about how they might combine with what you're doing until you have a personal connection with someone and you talk through it and you realize that you know you could actually do something really great together so that, that those personal connections are invaluable and having you know people co-located where there are things that you could kind of come up with uh, where the sum of the you know you're more than the sum of the parts together as a community is, is, is amazing to be part of and you know and again, I think that's something that's developed in the last few years. I mean, I, I may have been in Philadelphia the longest of anyone on the panel. You know, I'm at 28 years. And if you had checked in with me in, say, around the year 2000, tell me about this Philadelphia ecosystem, I would have said, I'm not sure there is one. I think you, know, you had a lot of competing companies back then. You even had a lot of what I would call competing academic institutions. The Science Center was there, but I don't think we had gelled. And again, you know, I talked about how people are now bigger risk takers. I, I think there's been a really good ecosystem that's developed. I don't think it happened without a lot of work. I know people um, who have really made an effort in the last decade or so to do things. Um, I think Venture Cafe is a great example of that. Um, there are some other groups as well. And uh, if you go back, I look at some of these people, some are entrepreneurs, some of them are investors who uh, want to get together. Um, some were just people who got really tired of feeling, you know, I'm going to say it again, driving to their work in the suburbs and driving home. So um, it didn't happen randomly. And everyone who contributed um, really made a big effort and it's paid off. Yeah, totally agree. And I do really wanna continue to shout out to the Science Center in particular for having just put in decades and decades yeah. of work to get the ecosystem to the point that it's at and to kind of build community um, because that stuff can feel amorphous, but boy, is it precious. <laughs> it's really, really, really hard to, to get if it's not already somebody who's really done all of that, that legwork. It's really incredible. All right, let's talk challenges. <laughs> what are the challenges within the Philly ecosystem? Um, I know space is a huge one. I know it's something I talk to people all day, every day about how they want more space and I wish we had more space for them. Um, and I know that that's true kind of across real estate uh, in the life sciences in Philly. The great thing is that this is an amazing place to start a company. The challenge is everyone suddenly realized that and the space hasn't caught up yet. So beyond just space, um, what kind of challenges are you guys seeing in the Philly ecosystem? Where do you think, you know, what do you think is next, the next problem to solve, I guess, for all of us? I, I, this is the one I've been harping on for a long time, money. And by money, I mean the big money. You know, we, we've raised our Series A with a lot of local support, which we really appreciate. Uh, but we're also a relatively small company. We're not going to have to raise 50 to $100 million to develop a product. I, and, and it's great that money from Boston and other places are now flowing in. What we would be great is to have our own homegrown large VCs. Um, you know, I, I will say one of the nice things about Kendall Square is you could literally walk in a 15 minute area 
and hit three or four VCs, each one of which can write a $50 million check if they so desire. Yeah. Um, it's great if they write that check for us down here. It would be even better if I could walk around, you know, a 15 minute loop through Center City or University City and be able to see those people as well. I would say, I think we can do a slightly better job in finding, I think, more talent. Of course, you know, we have some amazing institutes, you know, but I think we, are, we somehow still lose to some of those other cities, but I think we still need to do a little bit more work in finding, I think, you know, talent, especially with these focused and, you know, highly advanced cell and gene therapy, you know, companies. So I think we should, uh, although we are getting there, but uh, hopefully, you know, in the, in, the, in the months and years to come, we, uh, you know, uh, we develop more strategies so that, you know, we can get more people from outside, from Boston, New York to Philadelphia as well. So, yeah. And actually what I was going to add, uh, I just saw a question popped up from Bruce, um, was exactly tied to what Bruce was going to, is asking, I think. Um, well, not directly for Amicus. I know for a lot of the smaller companies in, in the area that getting access to manufacturing um, is a huge you know, challenge. And that's one sector that we really don't have a lot of in the Philadelphia area is kind of manufacturing for cell and gene therapy, especially kind of companies that are smaller. You know, for Amicus, we have, you know, pretty large needs and we have a good collaboration with Bramer Thermo Fisher and with Aldevron and we can get the things we need, but for smaller companies, sometimes it's hard to get kind of the attention from some of those, those bigger manufacturers. So I know that I, I've worked on some projects, I think with Science Center was involved with, with Chamber of Commerce as we looked at sectors that really could help kind of take us to the next levels and ecosystem. And I know kind of some, some in-house, in-city manufacturing would be, a, would be a great thing to have. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I've heard that uh, that request and from probably <laughs> two dozen companies at this point. And uh, it's definitely, I think, the next big thing that's coming to Philadelphia. Um, one of the other things I feel like is, is core facilities, right? We've been incredibly blessed. The Wistar Institute is down the street and it's just an absolutely world-class vivarium, microscopy facility, flow facility, all of these things that are both hugely capital intensive and time intensive, but also expertise intensive because each company can't be running its own vivarium, right? That just the, the talent it takes to do that and the long-term planning um, is really critical. So I think that, you know, the Wistar has been a huge boon to the city. Um, so has, you know, the universities more broadly, but um, I would not be surprised if there were more of those core facilities commercially available um, coming online in the next decade or so. Really interesting. So where do you think the ecosystem is going? That's kind of the big question. We've only got 15 minutes left, so I want to make sure we leave some time for questions. Um, what do you guys envision the future of Philly's cell and gene therapy ecosystem is going to look like, let's say, in the next five years? Um, and what are the, the pieces you really hope are in place by then? I mean, I, I personally, I, I think it's just going to be continued from what we've seen. You know, I think we'll continue to be very strong on the academic kind of leadership uh, on the research side of things. Hopefully we'll start to see some more manufacturing and um, I think we've reached a critical mass in terms of the drug development and other kind of core competencies that will lead to companies like Amicus or even bigger companies coming into this, the city. Um, you know, we'll start to see some of our smaller startup companies taking a step to the next level. So. Um, I mean, I think the future is super bright um, for, for the cell and gene therapy in Philadelphia. And um, just on that last comment, you had said, Malene, on the, on the Bavariums and things like that. I, I will say, um, you know, our, we have a great partnership with the University of Pennsylvania, and they are amazing in terms of their access to sort of, you know, all the development that's needed for the early discovery and preclinical work. And um, I have to give a shout out to them as also one of the, you know, keepers of the flame during the dark times of cell and gene therapy research that really kept the city relevant and was uh, kind of the, the core of what we built on, I think, in many ways. The future is bright, very bright. <laughs> I'm going nowhere. So, you know, let's, you know, yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, it's funny how things change. Um, right now we're in a space crunch. Um, but if every building that is supposed to be built or every conversion that takes place takes place, 
you know, we may be sitting here two and a half years from now going, wow, there's a lot of space there, you know. Um, I hope so. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I'm hoping that companies will be there to fill it in because, um, you know, I've done a lot of work with the Science Center, you know, used to, um, you know, be one of the judges for the uh, one of their programs and for QED. It was never a question of, are there enough applicants? It was always more applicants than we can give money to. So as we expand space and as I hope we expand funding, uh, maybe grow some of our, in, you know, uh, I'll call them, uh, you know, indigenous VCs here. Um, I'm hoping that as we build buildings, there'll be people to fill them in. Yeah. Looks like somebody's building a lot of buildings right near 3675, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them. A lot of them. All right, one last thing I want to ask you guys before we get to audience questions. Um, you know, how do we make sure that we're not just bringing in talent from outside, but actually creating opportunity for people who grew up in Philadelphia, especially people in West Philadelphia, um, where University City is located? Um, how do we lift up Philadelphia as a whole as all of this money flows into Philly and all of the, these opportunities um, grow? I mean, I, I can speak to a whole bunch of really exciting, you know, training programs and development programs. I know the Science Center is working on a workforce development program that's incredible. First Hand Labs is outstanding. There's a, a great internship program at the Star. Um, what other sorts of things do you guys see in the future that will sort of include more folks um, from Philadelphia in the cell and gene therapy ecosystem? I mean, w one thing, and, you know, as you get more mid-size or larger companies or our smaller companies get larger, there's just a lot more diverse, you know, type of roles. Um, right now, a lot of the small startups are super uh, research focused that kind of require a lot of times more advanced degrees. Not that there's not, you know, um, some good scientific roles that, you know, you don't require as much training. Um, you know, as you bring in manufacturing, as we mentioned, that's one that can open up a lot of job opportunities. Um, the other part of the ecosystem, you know, that we've been talking about is, is an aspect of that giving back to the community and the mentoring and trying to figure out how we do grow the, this, you know, the, the city in general in the way that you're talking about for opportunities. And um, that's something, again, I feel like the Amicus was starting to really look into ways to try to do that that got paused a little bit, but I also think that's a key part of what what the community, the research community should be focused on to make sure we are thinking about creating opportunities and um, not just being successful in our own kind of research focus and moving up moving on, but really trying to grow something here in the city. You know, I think another really important thing as well, um, maybe because I'm the child of two educators is we need to work on education. And the way to think about it is, you know, a lot of the best jobs in, um, in genetic medicine, it requires a PhD or at least a master's degree. Um, you don't get those without having a good solid base. And that really starts from the bottom up. I think we need to make sure that uh, education in Philadelphia, and I don't mean Penn, Temple, you know, Drexel, we're talking about public schools, other school options within Philadelphia have to be as strong as possible. You know, we have some of the best public education in Philadelphia, um, I should say in the Philadelphia suburbs. And you have schools like Central High School, which are, you know, have an amazing education. Central High sends 98% of their graduates to college. You know, we need to make sure that that exists throughout the entire city because everyone starts off with potential and we need to leverage it. Yeah. yeah, Tracy was just uh, highlighting that the five o'clock session is on K-12 education opportunities in this area specifically. So I would make a segue. Setting up the next yeah. session. That's awesome. <laughs> Both my nephews graduated from Central. I think it's a great school, but I agree. We need to make all the schools in Philly like Central. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And we are also having, you know, talks internally about how we can increase our corporate. We call it CSR, right? Corporate social responsibility. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we are trying our very best to how we can give back to the city itself, right? And have these programs where we can, you know, mentor and, you know, engage the local community and help them. 
um, you know, so yeah, so we are we are trying our very best. Being a small company, we are, but we are just trying a small, playing a small role and trying our very best to you know how to give back to the city wherever we can. I guess. That's great. All right, let's go to audience questions. Anybody have anything they would like to ask the panel? Feel free to put it in the chat. Um, There's a lot in the chat already. It looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've hit a good. Have we hit them all? I can't tell. Um, either individually or. Thing. Um, yep. Anybody want to hop in with questions? You can unmute. Do you want to ask the panel anything? Are any of you involved in uh, working with the government to try to increase incentives and funding to the area versus the other? large biotech clusters Philly falls very short in that regard. Yeah, I know Quorum just did a panel on that uh, earlier this week. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I'm planning to go back and see that. Um, uh, I know that, um, you know, Life Sciences PA has been very active in lobbying. Um, that does tend to happen more at the state level than the national level. Um, but they do are they're connected at the national level as well. I think um, part of it is we do have some good programs. Um, you know, Ben Franklin Technology Partners, for example, and uh, just to you know for fair balance, they are one of our investors. You know, that's the sort of organization where if we can get more government funding, they can uh, support more companies coming out of the Philadelphia ecosystem. And that's one of the things I think really helps. You know, where you can have direct funding. Um, you tend to get more direct results. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, Amicus, we do we do lots of different governmental lobbying at different levels, mostly advocating for rare disease patients. And um, I think as we're now putting down more roots in Philadelphia, we'll start to look at what we can do in Philadelphia specifically. Um, we actually did just this year, move our corporate headquarters actually to 3675, not just our R&D research center. So I think now with Philadelphia being our corporate headquarters, you know, we'll have a lot more opportunity to start to try to engage with local government, state government, to try to do some of the, the kind of advocating like you just mentioned. Yeah. And I, it so I type my question into the chat, but for each of you, which is your, what's your next really big challenge and your biggest concern in conquering it? Uh, I'll go first. And hi, Jean, good to see you. Okay. Um, growth. You know, uh, and we need three key items to grow. We need money, people, and space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, money because you, uh, you know, you need to invest before you can grow um, space because we, we, you know, you know, we'd love to stay at BioLab CIC, um, but you know, we need our own space and people, and that's actually where it's interesting. Two years ago, hiring a scientist was not that difficult. Yeah. It has become more difficult, and I'm not surprised because it's connected to the space issue. We're running out of space because we have more companies. They're also competing for some of the best minds we have. And it goes back to what I said earlier. You can't just hire someone randomly. You know, if you need a, someone with a master's or a PhD, um, there are only so many of them right now. I will just add manufacturing to what just Matt said. I mean, because manufacturing, I mean, we, we have our own manufacturers and we have good relationships with them, but we would like to have, you know, our own manufacturing sometime in Philadelphia itself. And, we don't control our manufacturing and our stuff gets delayed all the time, which again impedes the growth as well, right? But I think uh, for us, the, my, my biggest challenge right now is how I can get my stuff manufactured and delivered on time because it just delays and delays, right? So that is something which I'm actually working to, you know, fix right now. Yeah, um, I did just want to highlight in the chat, um, Audrey was talking about the Center for Breakthrough Medicines in King of Prussia that's bringing online 700,000 square feet of GMP manufacturing space. Um, for companies of all size. So I just want to make sure that we mention that because it's a really, really great point. Exciting thing coming online. Um, 
we've got uh, someone asked about um, is that are any of you aware of any research on ALS um, in the Philadelphia area? Yeah, I know um, some early research going on in some of the academic place. Maybe I'm not can talk about it specifically though. There definitely is some early stage research in ALS, specifically more genetic based ALS, which is a subset. Um, you know, maybe I think 10 to 15 percent are related to SOD1 mutations, and that's an area I think where there's, you know, some real excitement about things that could be done. Um, ALS more broadly, the sporadic type, it's a little harder given we still have a lack of understanding in many cases about what causes it. Um, I'm not sure if Vinya or Matt, if you know of anyone doing ALS research in the city. I'm aware of the SOD one, uh, some relationships we have with some collaborators, but uh, feel free to reach out to me after the call and uh, I'll be happy to connect. But it's just basic research, not clinical. Yeah, there's definitely research going on in uh, some of the um, universities here, but I'm not sure who are the professors that are actually doing the work right now. Great. And a great place if you're interested in any clinical trials going on is always clinicaltrials.gov. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll show you every single clinical trial in the country that's going on. Oh, good talk. Hi, uh, yes, hi, I'm Arlene. Oh, we lost you. I think we lost you. Okay, here you go. Go ahead. Okay, I have ALS, and uh, I have been trying to find people here in St. Louis who uh, there's a lab here, research yeah, lab. Tim, Tim Miller is Miller Labs, and uh, there's 20 genes, apparently. <clears throat> um, there might be 25, but we're 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 desperately looking for gene therapy. Um, and then there's some solutions out there, apparently. Or maybe stem cell research. Yeah, um, thank you for joining. And yeah, I think, as I mentioned, clinicaltrials.gov is a great place to go and see active clinical trials that are ongoing. And, you know, you'll sometimes you can get a lot. I presume right now for ALS, you'll see a number of trials. Not that many are necessarily interventional, but um, I know that there is some stem cell research, some gene therapy research, even some clinical trials likely. Um, so please take a look there. I think that's probably your best one-stop shop to see sort of what currently is, is at the right. stage of actually being in humans. Great. Right, but, but, but the trick is uh, you, you gotta reach out and uh, we're submitting her gene mapping. All right. I'm so sorry for what you're going through. I hope you guys find something that's helpful. Likewise. Oh, uh, Vino put yeah. clinicaltrials.gov in the chat. Um, so be sure to take a look there. All right, I'm afraid we're out of time, folks. It was great talking to you. Thank you all so much for your, your great insights. And uh, thank you to all of our audience members for great questions. Thank you to um, the Venture Cafe team for putting this on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Melina and Matt okay. and you. Can't wait to Thanks. see everyone in person. Yeah. Yep. And uh, can't wait for that beer. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Science Center. Bye-bye. Be safe.